Hey folks, Dave LaRock here. We're going to go over the content for our meeting from Thursday, February 2nd, 2017 for West Bay Empires. The agenda tonight is pretty straightforward. Just three topics. Regulation 6, Rule Number 1, and any kind of rule changes. Now, Regulation 6 and Rule 1, I'm just going to pick out some of the important highlights here, or at least as we see them. I'm not going to go through every single facet of them because, frankly, a lot of them really don't apply. But we'll talk about that as we get into it. So regarding Regulation 6, okay, Regulation 6 deals primarily with players uh, and mostly with pitching, actually, and what they are allowed or not allowed to do. Okay? Not so much the rules around how to pitch, but uh, pitch count, things of this nature, and you'll see in a moment. So, Regulation 6. Any player on a regular season team may pitch. That's pretty straightforward. Except for any player who has played at the position of catcher in four or more innings, they're not able or not eligible to pitch on that calendar day. So, if you've got a catcher out there that has caught four innings, they may not pitch. Okay. It doesn't come up that much in the league, and Regulation 6 is one of those things where we're not looking to actively enforce these things, by the way. We're not looking to track it. We don't have to track pitch count. We don't have to manage pitch count. We don't have to track number of innings that that catcher was out there. This isn't stuff that you need to bring a pad and paper for to jot down to make sure that you get these rules right. This is up to the managers of each team to manage. Okay. If they have a question, they're going to come to you. Because, let's face it, Little League managers don't always know all the rules. And they're going to maybe try and get something either through an underhanded or shady way or just through pure and sure, uh, pure ignorance. They'll, they'll try and pull something over us. So the important part here and the takeaway really is what constitutes that fourth inning? And there's an approved ruling that goes with this that says basically warm-up pitches do not count only when the ball is live. So here's the scenario. You've got little Johnny who comes out to catch. He catches in the first, the second, the third, and he comes back out for the fourth inning. The pitcher takes a couple of warm-up pitches. The manager realizes, hey, wait a minute, I got Johnny scheduled to pitch later in this game. He already took three warm-up tosses. Can the manager pull him at that point, switch catchers, and then therefore Johnny is now eligible to go and pitch? Absolutely. No problems there. The whole idea really is that we want to avoid protests. And it's important to note, and this approved ruling really is here, so that we understand what constitutes an inning. Okay? And it's a live pitch to a live batter when the ball is live and in play. Regulation B. Any pitchers that are once removed from the mound cannot return as a pitcher, except in any division that's not majors or minors. So intermediate and above, a pitcher who remains on defense stays in the game, but moves to a different position, can return any time, but only once. So Johnny comes out, pitches the first inning, pitches the second inning, manager pulls him, throws him over on first base. Fourth inning comes along, he says, man, I'm running, show, I'm running short on pitching, let me have Johnny go back in, he can. Johnny can pitch, as long as, of course, he's under his pitch threshold that we'll talk about. Johnny can continue to pitch. If he gets pulled again, even though he might stay in the game defensively and go to third base or right field or wherever, he is no longer eligible to come back and pitch. He may not return to the mound for a, th for a if you will, a third time on the mound. In terms of pitching restrictions, again, we don't have to manage pitching counts. Okay, the pitch counts are monitored by designated people at the game. Usually there's somebody either in the stands or whatever. The teams are pretty good about managing this stuff in between half innings. They'll go out and they'll go, Bob, I got 36 for Johnny, is that right? Yeah, I got 36, good, and they're off with it. So that's fine. Okay, it's important to note, however, that this is by league age. It's not necessarily by little league level. There are plenty of 10-year-olds playing in the majors. And there are some darn good 10-year-old pitchers that you're going to see as well. So if there's a question, please understand that this is by league age. So if you've got a 10-year-old that throws 75 pitches, he's done. Even if just about every other pitcher in the league is 11 or 12, and they get up to 85, this is by league age. Okay? A couple of things about pitching. First off is that if that pitcher reaches the limit they may continue to face that batter. They can complete the at-bat. So there are some stipulations here in terms of what completes that at-bat. First off is that the batter reaches base, right? Walk, base hit, 
catcher's interference, whatever, who cares? Kid makes it to first base, okay? Pitcher's done. The batter is put out. Pretty straightforward. We got an out. Okay, that pitcher is done. Or the third out is made to complete the half inning or game. And this can be on a defensive player. So runner steals from first to second, catcher throws down, through some miracle of little league, he gets the kid going into second. Okay? If that happens, the pitcher is done. If, if that happens and that completes the third inning, uh, excuse me, the, the half of the inning, then that pitcher is done. So let me, let me restate that because I stumbled through it. If you've got two outs, there's a throw down to second and a caught stealing out, the half inning is over, and that pitcher is done. Even though the batter who was at bat gets to come back out, the pitcher may not come back out and re-face that batter, if you will. <clears throat> okay, so here's another caveat. A pitcher who delivers more than 40 pitches, or 41 or more is the way this is worded, they cannot play the position of catcher. So again, it's important to understand how many pitchers that kid has thrown and who the catchers are. You're not going to manage that, but a manager is going to question it. So if a manager comes out and says, hey, that kid was throwing for the first three innings and now he's catching, how many pitches did he have? I had him down for 52. If that's the case, you've got to get that catcher out of there. <clears throat> Any player who's attained the league age of 12 is not eligible to pitch in the minor league. Whatever. Uh, this rarely comes up. Some of you folks who are new to the organization or are you junior umpires who are doing minor league games, again, this is something that you need to understand the rule in case anybody ever questions. You're not going to go out looking to enforce this. You're not going to go out and ask the age of every pitcher that comes out. That's crazy. All you're going to be able to do is if a manager questions it and it turns out that that kid is a league age 12 on the mound, that you've got to get him out of there. Okay. What about pitching in more than one game in a day? Minor league, little league, and intermediate? Uh-uh. Now, it's exceptionally rare that little league baseball plays double headers. Okay. However, in junior and senior league, a player may pitch in up to two games as long as that pitcher did not throw 31 pitches or more in the first game. So let's say we brought in a closer in the bottom of the seventh to shut down the other team. Kid threw 28 pitches. That's a pretty bad shutdown, but let's say he threw 12 pitches and he got out of it. He is able to pitch in the second game. Now, what about kids who play in AAU games? So he, kids, some kids got a 10 a.m. and a 12 p.m. AAU doubleheader, and then he comes down and he plays Little League. We don't care about AAU. We have no idea. It's, it's poor management if that coach or manager asks this kid to throw, especially if they already went a couple innings in their AAU game and threw a lot of pitches, that, that's a little insane. We can't enforce anything that's external, so keep that in mind. What about how do we withdraw an ineligible pitcher? So what happens if? Okay, so let's say that kid comes out, starts warming up, and the manager from the opposing team says, man, we faced this kid last night. He can't pitch today, or we faced him two days ago when he threw 80 pitches. He can't pitch today. He's not eligible. So after much ado, we discuss this, <clears throat> and what do we need to do? We need to get him out of there. Okay? Now, there's a caveat to this rule as well. Okay? In the intermediate junior seniors, we just pull the kid. However, in the majors and the minors, there's an additional consideration, and that's if that pitcher is determined to be ineligible and we get him off the mound, the last pitcher of record, so whoever was throwing this kid replaced, is not eligible to come back. So Johnny goes out, he throws, manager wants to bring in Tommy. Tommy throws a couple of pitches, it's appealed, realize that Tommy is not an eligible pitcher, Johnny cannot come back on the mound. Pitches delivered in games declared regulation tie games or suspended games, whatever, shall be charged against the pitcher's eligibility. Well, what does this mean? It means that it's still a game. It means that their pitch count stays. So how does this affect things? Okay. Well, if suspended games are resumed on another day, the pitchers of record at the time of the game that was halted may continue to pitch only to the extent of their eligibility for that 
day provided, of course, they observe the required day of rest. So what does this all mean, all right? Well, first of all, there's a, a small little exception in here, and that's if we don't get out of the first inning. Let's talk about this exception first, and then we'll get into the use cases. So if we don't get out of the first inning, okay, Johnny comes out, he throws 46 pitches and gets absolutely lit up. And the manager doesn't have any other pitchers, so he's going to leave little Johnny out there and little Johnny's going to continue to get lit up. So finally, after a 6 nothing 43 pitch top of the first, we go into the bottom of the first. Next kid comes out from the opposing team, obviously, throws a couple of pitches, crack, bash, boom, here comes the lightning, here comes the thunder, here comes the rain. We look at the radar, decide that we're going to call it because there's no sign of this thing letting up. Okay, We did not complete the first inning. So even if that kid did throw 43 pitches, it's as if he didn't throw any at all. There is no restriction on his eligibility when he comes back, let's say we replay the game tomorrow night or the following. It doesn't matter. It's as if it didn't happen. So that's an important exception to understand. So here's some examples, okay? Uh, league age 12. So that means that he gets, what, 85 pitches, right? He throws 70 on a game on Monday and the game is suspended. So the game resumes on the following Thursday. That means that it's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Three days, in the, it's, there's, there's been two days of rest. Thursday is the third day. So he's not eligible to pitch because he hasn't observed the required days of rest. However, if we have the same scenario and the game on Monday again, and the game resumes on Saturday, he is eligible to pitch up to 85 more pitches in the resumption of the game because he has. So there's been a day of rest on Tuesday, Thursday, I'm sorry, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, four days of rest. So now he can come out and throw the full 85. However, in the same scenario, if we resume this two weeks later, it really, you know, now we're just making this up at this point. It's This is what happens when. So this kid, it's two weeks later, as long as he's had four days rest, which kind of goes without saying. This little example three is a kind of a, an obvious thing. But as long as he's had his four days rest, he can come out and pitch. No problems there. So let's move on, all right? Objectives of the game. Rule number one. Again, selected excerpts from rule one. 1.01. Little League Baseball in all divisions is a game between two teams of nine players under the direction of a manager, and important part here, not more than two rostered coaches played in a regulation Little League field in accordance with these rules under the jurisdiction of one or more umpires. So, rostered. They have to be managers of that team. They cannot be dad off the bench outside the fence because somebody couldn't make it because of work. It's the league. You know, these guys are volunteers. They're out there they're out there humping trying to do something good for the kids. And life gets in the way sometimes. So what happens when you've got a manager that shows up and he doesn't have two coaches with him because they had other commitments? Well, that manager has to stay in the dugout the entire time. That means that the base coaches are kids with helmets. There's no, hey, Bob, you're not doing anything tonight. Come on down and sit in the dugout with these kids so I can go coach third base. Uh-uh. Rostered coaches. Got to be listed there. What about if he's a coach of another team? Well, he's not on that team's roster, so he can't be there either. Okay? Keep that in mind. You will, you will have that come up. 1.02. The objective of each team is to win by scoring more runs than the opponent. <laughs> Welcome to baseball. One zero three. The winner of the game shall be the team that sh ha <clears throat> the winner of the team which shall shall have scored in accordance with these rules. The greater number of rules at the conclusion of the regulation game. So a lot of legal verbiage for you know whoever has the most toys wins. Got it. So this graphic shows what a sixty foot diamond home plate area looks like. And there's just a couple of things that I want to point out here. Uh, number one, we've got home plate in the middle. That's the important part, 17 inches square with corners lopped off. So that means that it's from this midpoint, 8.5 inches forward, 8.5 inches back. The batter's box is here, and they differ slightly from the intermediate level and above, only because they are 3 feet wide. 
It's still six feet deep, so you still get six feet from the front to the back. This is, in my opinion, the most horrendous Little League drawing ever. When we look at this thing, it looks like I've got three feet from here up. This is just not proportionate, man. That looks like it's probably four feet back, even though. And this looks like it's the middle line. It's garbage. I hate this drawing. But it's important to understand that from the middle of the plate, that's what bisects the batter's box. So why is this important? All right. First of all, you got a probably about an 85% chance when you show up at the field that there actually are batter's boxes. As you get a little bit older, when you get to the juniors and the seniors, that drops to about a 50% chance because they're playing on high school, <clears throat> excuse me, high school fields. They're playing on muni fields that uh, are shared between a number of organizations, and there's not usually a, a lining machine out there or people to man it. So please understand. When we look at this, what's important about that is the fact that even if you did have lines at the beginning of the game, you're going to get them scuffed out. Some kid slides into home, forget it, they're gone. You've got nothing left. So what do we need to do? We just need to make sure that the batter is not taking advantage of the batter's box or the batter's area. So how do we do that? Well, if you think about this from an easy standpoint, all right, where do we know where the back of the box is? if that line was wiped out? Or where do we know where the front of the box is? Because if a batter is outside of those areas with one foot completely outside and they hit the ball, they're out. There's a rule on that. We want to take that out if that kid's getting an unfair advantage. So what we can do to kind of come up with something that's generally close enough for government work, if you will, is every Little League bat that a 12-year-old uses is probably at uh, 30, 31 inches maybe. They really don't swing a 32-inch bat anymore. Let's say that they're 30 inches. So what we've got here is from this part of the plate back, okay, that's the middle of the plate back, we've got 36. This is 8 inches more, 8.5 inches more technically. So really if you take a Little League bat and you put it from the knob so that the knob is on the point itself, not up against it, but on it. So the, the knob of the bat is on the plate going back. You have a pretty good idea of where you can draw a line to denote where the back of the batter's box is. Conversely, from the front of the plate as well. So if you take the, the knob of the bat and you place that knob on the front of home plate and you extend it out, that's generally going to be where the front of the batter's box is. Each batter's box lines are probably, you know, three inches anyway, so you got a little bit of a fudge factor here. We just want to keep it fair. We're not looking to bang people out for, you know, an inch over an imaginary line. We just want to make sure that some kid has not got his front foot up here where it shouldn't be. Okay. Another example, the catcher's box obviously is different for the intermediate and above. They are, as I said, four feet wide as opposed to three, and they are six feet deep just like the other ones. Plate still 17 inches. Okay, This one has a much better representation uh, of a drawing. It looks a lot more to scale when you've got that midpoint of the plate, three up, three back. Okay. Let's move on from that. So 1.08, the league shall furnish players benches. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> there's, I mean, there need to be benches, yes, okay, whatever. We're not going to stop the game if there's not benches. But the important part here is that the notes here, okay? Note number one, the on-deck position is not permitted in the Little League Major Division and below. No on-deck batters, ever, period. One kid with a bat at any time. What about if the kid comes up in between the half inning, okay? Does the other batter get to come out? Uh-uh. Only the first batter of each half inning is permitted outside the dugout. Period. Okay? What happens before every game? Or sometimes in between half innings? You get three kids coming up, six kids coming up, swinging bats, half of them don't have helmets on, somebody's going to get whacked, I ain't putting up with it. Okay? No on-deck batters. If you're starting the game and the other team is warming up, one kid out of the dugout, period, end of story. There is an approved ruling here, so if you guys can envision, for example, the dugouts at Warwick Continental, whatever it's called now, Continental North, no, Continental American, that's what it is. Uh, if you can envision those areas, each dugout has a little area, like where Al Man sits, uh, that has an area where a kid could conceivably come up and swing a bat. Uh-uh. Fenced-in areas may not be used for an on-deck batter. Okay, 1.11, A3. 
So this is regarding the pitcher and regarding his uniform or her uniform at that point. Any part of the pitcher's undershirt or t-shirt exposed to view shall be of a solid color. Well, what about the uniforms with the camouflage? Well, it's not part of the uniform. It's an undershirt. Well, what about the neoprene sleeves that come out that are all camouflaged? Well, if you've got a neoprene sleeve on, it's got to be covered by an undershirt. Okay? So the sleeve can be worn as long as there's an undershirt underneath it and provided that the undershirt is not white or gray. Okay? Also, nothing on their hands, wrists, arms. Okay? No rope bracelets, no rubber bracelets, no any no watches no rings no earrings no nothing no jewelry no anything on their hands wrists or arms when they're pitching this is take it off or don't pitch but blue what if we've got a little rope bracelet that's cool and we put that thing on and it's designed to stay on for like two years and i can't cut it off cut it off or don't pitch kid it's easy Okay? Most of the time they're good about that. They'll, they'll take it right off for you. You just have to catch them. Uh, regarding things like this, guys, you know, I can't tell you how many times, and I'm sure you've all been in the same boat, that you go out, you work a game, you tell the kid to take it off, and you hear, but the last guy that was umping the game didn't make us take it off. Or even worse, God forbid, but the last guy who was umping the game said he would just look the other way. Holy crap, come on, guys. I know at the end of the day that it's not going to hurt anybody, that there's just a snowball's chance of anything going wrong, but God forbid something happens while this kid's wearing a necklace, where he's wearing a band, or a coach comes out and starts complaining. Just, just take him off, okay? It's, there's a rule, just take it off. 1.11, here's the jewelry component, all right? nothing on there. The only thing that they're allowed is a medical alert bracelet. So if they've got something that says I'm a diabetic or I'm prone to seizures or whatever it happens to be, um, it could be something religious as well that denotes to, you know, um, Christian science where do not treat me medically or whatever it happens to be, that's, that's okay. Okay. Uh, but anything else got to go. And don't, don't let me tell you that the little red, red socks bracelets or whatever they're wearing are a religion. <laughs> Sorry, I like the socks, but you ain't getting that one over on me. So 1.12. Here's another one that I see uh, that comes up. Actually, I see this a lot. So the catcher must wear a catcher's mitt, not a first baseman's mitt or a fielder's glove. When does this come into play? comes into play when coach sends out little Johnny to catch, and Johnny's a lefty. That's great. Okay, now, you, not only do you have to deal with a lefty catcher who at Little League level can't catch to begin with, okay, there's no lefty catcher's mitt. Okay, well, little Johnny ain't catching. Okay, well, he's just going to catch with his first baseman's glove. Hells no. Okay, now we start to get into some of the rules here, and you'll see in the next one as well, that are directly related to player safety. Any rule that is related to player safety is paramount in our organization and anywhere that you go. If you let some kid come out and catch with a infielder, an outfielder, a fielder's mitt, or a first baseman's mitt, and that little kid catches a fastball or a foul tip or something on the thumb and he breaks his thumb, we live in a litigious society. People are going to want their hospital bills paid for. And if little Johnny needs pins in his thumb and he can't write with his hand or whatever it happens to be, it's going to come back at you. And they're going to say, hey, Blue, when you get called to the table or for a deposition for the attorney in East Greenwich, who's his dad, who wants some money out of your butt, says, hey, um, seems to be a rule here. Why did you let him uh, catch without a catcher's mitt? If you had a catcher's mitt on, it might not have been prevented, but at least you would have been playing, you would have been following the rules. Don't get yourself caught in that. We don't want to see anybody get hurt. I certainly don't want to see anybody get sued. Okay. Number twelve. Here's the other part of this. Now we start to get into that catcher's gear. Okay. Cup, 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 cup. How do we enforce this? <laughs> well, obviously it's a little tricky when you start to talk about minors and and protective equipment. So the easiest way is at a pregame conference. Hey, coach, how you doing? 
Coaches, can you please certify that all of your players, including your catchers, are wearing the proper equipment? And you give them a little nod, a little, nod, a little wink, and kind of smile. They know exactly what you're talking about. Okay? And they, as long as they say yes, you're good to go. Again, don't send out a catcher without a cup on. Man, I don't, I don't, if you guys want to go out and umpire without a cup on, you're morons. I'll tell you straight to your face. I have taken some hits. Okay? That's up to you. But the kids must be protected. This also has to do with the dangling throat protectors. Okay? So kid goes out with a dangling throat protector or without a dangling throat protector, stop, go get one, period. Okay? If they don't have one, borrow the other team's mask. It's that simple. Do not let a kid go out. Again, what are the odds? Probably about the same odds as hitting Powerball. I don't know about you, but I'd like to hit Powerball someday. So I kind of hope for those odds. I'm not hoping some little kid takes one to the trachea. But we want to make sure that they're safe. This is a rule. Okay? Also, when you're talking about skull caps and, and catcher's equipment, this isn't permitted. Skull caps are what you see at the older levels. So the challenge is here that skull caps are not permitted in any little league. So you've got a high school catcher who comes out with a two-piece. He's got a mask and a helmet. That's the skull cap. Okay. He comes out with his high school gear to do a little league seniors game. Well, he can't. Can't wear that. And not only that, he's got to get a mask with a dangling throat protector. Okay. Wearing a catcher's helmet and a mask, again, even if that mask has a long wire extension, so if he's got the King Tut beard extension coming down off the thing, I don't care if that goes down to, you know, halfway down his chest, He's still got to have a throat protector on there. Okay? And hockey styles are, are approved. Of course, they're pretty much the de facto helmet anyway. But even with that, you still have to have that. So in short, every level of Little League, there are no masks or other equipment that will exempt a catcher from wearing a dangling throat guard. This is a required item, period. Do not look the other way. Rule changes. 602C, this applies to baseball and softball. This allows a local league the option to mandate that batters keep one foot in the batter's box. Finally, high school's been doing this for years. We want to keep this game moving. If you watched any of the Little League World Series last year, or any of the regional tournaments, Bristol, whatever, you'll have seen this particular rule enforced. Okay, So, right now, league option. We're hopefully going to get house rules from all the leagues, and hopefully they are going to implement this, because if you look all the way down at the bottom, the note says that this is adopted as a tournament rule. During the tournaments, it's not going to be a league option. So just like we faced with the drop third strike or uncaught third strike a few years ago, some leagues didn't adopt it right away, but when it came down to tournament time, they were sadly and woefully unprepared. So hopefully they see the light, realize that, you know what, 2018 they're probably going to mandate this, and it's no longer going to be a league option. That's what we expect. Okay. So what's the penalty? Well, if the batter leaves the batter's box or delays play, and none of the exceptions apply, we'll talk about the exceptions in a minute, the umpire's got to warn the batter. Son, stay in the box. After one warning, the umpire shall call a strike. Any number of strikes can be called on that batter. So that little kid steps off, he does the David Ortiz walk around, spits on his gloves, slaps them together, crosses himself, looks up to the heavens, whatever it happens to be, and steps back into the box. Son, stay in the box. Do it again. I'm calling the strike. Kid does it again. Now, it's up to your discretion. We don't want to just start stealing strikes from, you know, 12-year-old Johnny. But maybe give him one more warning. If he's blatantly disregarding you and go, oh, sorry, Blue, I forgot. All right, let him slide. Okay? But when it comes down to it, you get one warning, kid. Stay in the box unless some of these exceptions happen. So let's talk about them. Uh, swing, slap, or check swing. Okay, so some of that slap or, uh, you know, we talked that in, in uh, softball too. Uh, if he's forced out of the box by a pitch, up and in, kid has to bail out. That's fine. Okay. Some of the players in Little League are not real good. You're going to see a pitch come middle-middle from a pitcher who's throwing hard, and that kid's going to bail out of the box. Okay. He's got to get back in. <clears throat> that pitcher did not force him out of the box. When the batter attempts a drag bunt in baseball or a slap or a slap bunt in softball, okay, certainly they're out of the box, but they've just got to come back in. They can't wander around for an hour. Okay, if the catcher doesn't catch the pitched ball, 
Okay? Pass ball, drops, whatever, that catcher can step out. He probably shouldn't because the batter's box is him. And it's interference if he gets in the catcher's way by stepping out. So be careful there. Uh, if a play has been attempted, so the catcher throws down a second on an attempted steal, kid can step out. Or if time is called, he can step out. Now again, we don't want to delay the game. The intent here of the rule is to make sure that the game stays at an even pace. It does speed up the game. So some of those little league games where you're out there screaming because this little kid's taking five seconds, ten seconds after every pitch to walk around, we're going to be saving those seconds. Right? So in baseball, another exception here is when the pitcher leaves the dirt area or softball when the pitcher leaves the circle. And then, of course, on a three-ball count that is a strike that the batter thinks is a ball. So, you know, you got <laughs> you got 3-0. <laughs> the next pitch better be a strike, kids, as long as it's close. You, you want that 3-1 count here. But if you've got 3-0 and it's borderline and this kid thinks it's a ball and chucks the bat and starts trotting down to first base and you bang a strike, okay, obviously he's allowed at that point. Again, you don't want him showing you up, so please understand that rule. But... That's what that's all about right there, okay? So here's the next one, 608A2. And this is for major and minor divisions. Okay? It allows for an intentional walk. Major and minor. Now in high school, you can request an intentional walk. Boom, no problem. Put them on. Okay, go to first, son. Now in Little League, they're doing something very similar. Okay, however, this is the mechanic here. This is prior to a pitch being thrown. Prior to a pitch being thrown. The defense elects to intentionally walk the batter by announcing such a decision to the plate umpire, and the question is how. So it's got to be made by the defensive manager, and he's got to request time. Dave, can I get time? Sure, Jerry, time. Dave, we want to put this batter on. No problem. It's on first base. Four pitches count towards the pitch count. Even though they weren't thrown, if you're going to put them on, okay, all you're doing really is eliminating the risk of what would normally be an intentional walk and the pitcher throwing the ball away. So that's the only advantage that a team is getting here. Again, only before the first pitch in the at-bat. Pitcher throws ball one, throws ball two, manager asks for time, comes out and requests an intentional walk. Nope. It's not the way it works. Okay? So it's important to understand when they can request an intentional walk and how it's requested. There's going to be some learning and some teaching to our little league um, to our little league managers when this comes out just like we kind of have to teach and mentor a little bit when it comes down to the uh, the appeal process so six uh, excuse me 806 B and this is the pitcher again this applies to intermediate and above okay and it clarifies that a pitcher removed and returning to the and the mound would retain his or her number of visits so it's important to remember how many times and this is where it gets tricky now how many times that manager went out and visited the pitcher prior to them being pulled so we'll know how many visits they get know the number of visits per inning know the number of visits per pitcher per game and you're going to actually have to keep track of that information now or somebody is going to Okay, because if the other manager comes out and says, hey, this kid re-entered, but the manager's on his next visit and talks to him, he's got to pull him, and you don't remember how many, how many visits he had prior, you're going to be in a little bit of trouble. So make sure that you're paying a little bit of attention to that. Okay. The last part here is that there's some clarification in terms of the umpire and also some unsportsmanlike behavior when it comes down to managers. So... This is all divisions. So the umpire obviously has the authority to disqualify any player, coach, or manager, okay, or substitute for objecting to decisions or for unsportsmanlike conduct or language, the usual stuff. That really didn't change. What they did clarify in here okay, is that the local league may determine if stealing and relaying of the pitch selection is considered unsportsmanlike. So each league, before the season starts, with their house rules, just like prior when we were talking about the kids staying in the box, they have to, they have to determine and rule on a house rule, or say, uh, create a house rule, whether or not 
relaying of signs and signals is unsportsmanlike. You know, it's you have to pardon my English here, but it's kind of a dick move. And in higher levels of baseball, if somebody's stealing signs, the next one's coming up and in. It's just part of the game. We don't preach that in Little League. It, it's just part of the process. But be aware that managers just shouldn't be doing this. Come on. It's, it's, there's no rule against it unless the league enforces this. Okay. So if the league says, yeah, that's unsportsmanlike, you can warn and then dump a manager if they are giving pitch location, for example. Okay. Things like that. Um, so again, pitch selection and location. That's not stealing signs from the third base coach. He's going on this pitch. Has nothing to do with it. But if you've got a third base coach peeking in, okay, and he's going, up and in, Jimmy. Well, guess what? That's unsportsmanlike. That's a warning and a possible ejection. Okay. There is a note at the bottom also that this also has been adopted as a tournament rule. In tournaments, it will not be a league option. If a manager is caught stealing signs and relaying them to the batter, they're the ones that are going to be ejected. And that's it. Thanks for your time today, you guys. Have a great day.